everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm Steve Sugar. Um, I'm from Canada, as he said. Any other Canadians in the audience? Yeah, there's one. <laughs> one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm from, I'm outside of Toronto. Our local team just won the basketball tournament. <laughs> the ch championship, sorry. Um, and uh, so yeah, my entire Twitter feed is all the Toronto Raptors and CSS Day. So, um, anyways, most people know me as the guy who teaches design to developers. So, um, I like to show how you can use tactics instead of talent to do design. Um, and today, I hope to do just that. So, in this talk, I'm going to be sharing a few tips that will help you improve your own designs. Um, now, I found that the best way to to teach this stuff is by example. So, my approach today is not going to be any different. We're going to be we're gonna be taking a look at an example that I created that addresses some of the more common problems that I've observed developers struggling with. So it's gonna be filled with a ton of mistakes I see being made. Um, and in that, I'm gonna try my best to explain what goes through my head when I work on a project like this. So let's start by taking a look at the example um, we'll be refactoring today. This is a design for like a fictional flight booking application. Now, I just want to emphasize that just, this is just an arbitrary example that I made because I felt it covered a lot of the, the concepts I wanted to share. I realized that not everyone's working on a flight booking application. Maybe you work at booking.com, I guess. <laughs> um, but um, I took a lot of the ideas here from existing booking applications, sort of gave it my own twist. Um, so this is our starting point. Um, so as you can see, it, it covers everything from form design, table design, uh, and data schemas. Um, it's more or less using a lot of Bootstrap defaults, which I see many developers relying on. Um, now, I don't want to like poo-poo on Bootstrap. It's it's a great starting point, but there's a lot of quick wins here that we can apply to make it more polished and, and just bring it to that next level. So, like I said, there's um, a lot of commonly used components here um, uh, that can be used on a variety of applications. So. Um, our goal today is just to touch on some cosmetic changes without, without affecting the overall structure. So let's start by moving back to the top here, and we'll, we'll just kind of work our way down as I, as I get through it. Um, so the most glaring problem here is um, it sort of starts with that text on that background image. So it's because it's on a photo. Photos are pretty dynamic in that they have a, a lot of light areas and a lot of dark areas. And um, you need to give text a consistent contrast. Um, so using a background image like this, it's, it's, really easy, it's a really easy way to add impact to a hero. But with that, you run the risk of having poor contrast with text when it's overlaid on top, especially on top of busy areas. Um, in this case, there's, there's sort of some background interference with some of the labels on the left. Um, now, the easy way to work around this is to find an image that contains a lot of negative space that provides you with like an area for text, but sometimes that's easier said than done. Um, especially when you're like digging through like a royalty free library for like that perfect photo. So the way to solve this problem is to limit the amount of dynamic elements on the image. So one way to do that is by simply adding like a semi-transparent overlay. Um, this will tone down the light areas, giving them less contrast against the dark areas and help the text stand out. And of course you can invert this treatment and use uh, like a white overlay with dark text. Um, now you can do this in CSS, of course, but um, for like a little more control, I, like if you have access to like like graphical editing software like Sketch or Figma, um, you can bring in the image there and adjust the contrast and brightness for similar results. Um, but you can even take this a step further and colorize the image with a single color. Um, this is just a great way to add impact to a hero and, and pair it with your existing um, brand colors. So. Um, again, this can be achieved in code um, by using CSS blending modes, but that does have limited browser support. So again, I personally recommend bringing it into um, some graphical editing software to create that effect. So I'm going to show you how to do that in Figma. Uh, Figma is it's free until you start using projects, and um, so it's, everyone should have access to this. Um, now, when you import the image uh, and click on it, you'll be presented with a few options on, on the right sidebar. Uh, Figma has this kind of progressive, progressive disclosure where if you like, it kind of gives you the options based on the stuff you're interacting with. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is desaturate the image. So click on the thumbnail, and you'll be presented with a bunch of editing options. Um, from there, you'll, you can reduce the saturation to zero, um, so it's a black and white image. And then you can adjust the contrast and a few other things just to level things out a bit. Um, then you're going to add a fill layer on top of that by clicking the plus icon next, uh, next to the fill title in the sidebar. And then from there, you can choose the color you want. So I chose this blue. 
Um, and then in the color panel, um, go up to that little drop icon up in the top right corner. And uh, from there, you're going to want to change the blending mode to multiply. And, and what this does uh, is it allows the image to sort of show through. Um, and after this, you can even adjust the opacity to like um, of the solid color just to bring some of those more those details out a bit more. Um, now, if you're working with like a darker color like this blue I'm using here, it, you'll definitely have enough contrast for your text. Now, um, Figma is free, like I said. Um, you should have access to it. But another great tool I found, someone told me about it on Twitter. I, I wish I could give them credit, but I, I was trying to dig it up. I couldn't find the who, who told me about this. But um, it's this web tool called Duotone. It's by Shape Factory. It allows you to take two colors and, and use them on the highlights and lowlights of an image. So in the example here, um, you know, it's using the, a bright cyan for the highlights and a purple for the lowlights. So you can even mix it up and, and choose two completely different colors. It sort of has that, like, if you go on like Spotify, those like album covers have that, that effect to it. So um, check it out, play around with it. It's pretty cool. Um, uh, and this web app actually allows you to upload your own images or search for images from Unsplash. Um, by the way, I thought everyone knew about Unsplash, but every time I mention it, I always get a few surprise faces. So it's basically just a great resource if you're looking for high quality, free, royalty free uh, images. Basically, you can just search based on the subject and you'll get a ton of great results. Well, yeah, like I said, it's just a great way to add impact to Hero and, and pair the image with your existing brand colors. So, um, and of course, it gives you a nice consistent contrast in the background, so our text is much more legible. Now, I chose this dark blue for the site, but I don't want to just graze over that. I thought it would be helpful to share how I choose primary colors for a site. Uh, the answer to that is quite simple. I steal them. Um, I spent a lot of time looking on inspiration sites. I go to landbook.com, land-book.com. Um, another one is siteinspire.com. These are all just like, like web galleries. We're all familiar with them. Um, they're usually curated, curated by designers. Um, so there's a few, just to name a few. Um, and while browsing, if I see a combination of colors I like, I may bookmark it or just sample the colors for a reference later. Um, another great place we're all probably familiar with is Dribbble. Um, now, if you have a general idea of what colors you want to use already, um, Dribbble has this like color picker tool. So you can access, so if you go to like that three dotted menu thing up at the top um, and open that up, it has this color link at the bottom. And there you can search for shots based on a specific color you have in mind. So um, uh, having like a limited palette like this um, should make that a bit easier to make that decision. So from there, um, you get a ton of great results using colors handpicked by professional designers. So, um, you know, once I find uh, an example I like, uh, I usually sample the colors found in the bottom right of the dribble shot. Uh, now, to be perfectly honest, I usually find something I like, like the blue and yellow from this shot, um, and then I end up using Tailwind CSS default colors. Um, so Tailwind CSS, it's, it's a framework created by my friend Adam Wathen. Um, it, it takes a utility-first approach. Uh, I'm not going to get much into Tailwind. Uh, that's a whole other thing. But um, I'm quite involved with this project, uh, so admittedly I'm quite biased. But uh, I spend a ton of time choosing these colors on the, on the framework, so the default colors. So um, I, I mostly just want to emphasize the benefits of working with a constrained palette, right? Um, so if Tailwind's not your thing, that's fine. But uh, approach a project with uh, a constrained set of uh, colors. So in this case, if I'm using the uh, the blue and the yellow from that dribble shot, I might just use like the blue and yellow or like an orange from the palette and tailwind. So um, I find it much easier to work with a constrained palette like this instead of aimlessly picking colors from, from a color picker. Um, I like to have like nine or 10 shades of a single hue to work with. Um, and by using a constrained palette, you avoid having like 40 unique text colors and, and 50 unique background colors where um, many of the colors are very close to each other. So this data comes from CSSStats.com and um, these are the stats from Facebook. And so for example, we can, if we take a closer look at the text colors here, um, you can probably consolidate all these dark grays into a single text color, right? Um, the same could probably be said about some of the reds you see there. Um, all the reds are really close to each other um, and some of the blues there too. Um, so yeah, um, now that we've added the blue, we'll be introducing that yellow from the shot shortly. Um, but I just want to get into the nav bar. So first, nav bars don't need to be in a bar. Um, and by putting the navigation elements directly on the background, um, it helps things open up a little bit more and makes things more comfortable, gives everything more room to breathe. 
Um, so, and if you want to give it a little more subtle boundary, um, you can add like a light border like I did here. Um, I just use like a single white pixel border with reduced opacity. Um, this will also kind of, like I like using borders like this where it, it sort of draws, it kind of connects the, the, the elements with the left of the elements on the right. It sort of associates them a bit better. better. Um, so it's much cleaner than like having it contained in a, in a bar. Now, now that we've adjusted the background, um, this headline, it's, it's looking better, uh, but I want to create a little more contrast between the headline and the subtitle. Um, right now, it's just kind of using size, which is fine. So it, it, you know, it does create that contrast, but um, it's not the only way I like to approach that. Um, another way to do that is by using a softer color. Now, to make white text softer on a dark background, your first instinct might be to darken the text by decreasing the lightness, so it's like a light gray. Um, and this does that trick of de-emphasizing it, um, but it always looks a bit off on a colored background. So uh, tip number two, don't use gray text on colored backgrounds. You need to consider that what we're trying to achieve is, is reduce contrast and that you want to make text closer to the background color, um, not gray. Now you might think the best way to do this is by reducing the opacity. And yeah, while this does reduce the contrast, it often results in the text looking a little dull and washed out. So, I find a better approach to this is to uh, hand pick a color based on the, the background color. Now, if you're using something like, like I do, I use the Tailwind colors, so it already considers this. Um, um, and you can just use one of the lighter colors, right? But if you're choosing your own colors, I typically just start by sampling the background and, and adjusting the saturation and lightness until it looks about right. So if you're familiar with the color picker like this, um, this is the HSB picker. That's what you get on most graphical editing tools and browser dev tools. Even though they use HSL, they give you an HSB picker, whatever. Um, I would just drag the picker to like the top left for a lighter color. Um, and the end result might look something like this. So it's, it's a subtle change, but it looks better. Now, you can even take this a step further by rotating the hue by, and using um, the perceived brightness to your advantage. So what do I mean by that? Um, well, every hue has an inherent perceived brightness. So in this diagram, I have the hue shown on the left, and then on the right, I'm showing how they actually perceived, how the lightness is actually perceived. So when you're working with colors like yellow and blue, um, even when each hue have the same lightness value, yellow still looks brighter, right? So this is called luminance. Uh, that's a technical term. <laughs> and by taking samples of different hues with 100% saturation and 50% lightness, we get a good sense of how uh, the perceived brightness of different colors work. So, so if you look at this chart, I plotted all the different hues to show what colors have the highest and lowest perceived brightness. So you can see that yellow is the brightest, like I said, and blue is the darkest. Um, the, but one thing that's notable is that it's not, like a, it's not a linear pattern. So um, how does all this help us? Well, the cool part about all of this is that normally when you want to change how light a color looks, you can simply adjust the lightness value, right? As shown on the top here. Um, while this does work to lighten or darken the color, um, you often lose some of the color's intensity. So since different hues have uh, a different perceived brightness, you can also change the brightness of a color by rotating the hue to the nearest bright color. So if we go back to our chart here, um, because you know, the background you're using is blue, uh, we're going to rotate the hue to the nearest bright color, so cyan in this case. And so going back to this, you can see that it's a pretty nifty trick to create some like sexy looking gradients. Uh, but this trick also works great when you're working with light text on colored backgrounds. So um, if we go back to our design here, here's what our, um, our original, like just lighter blue. Um, but if we rotate the hue, um, it's just a great way to make text a little bit more accessible um, but while still keeping it colorful. Okay, so it's starting to get a little bit more interesting here. Um, now, as much as this dark background helps to distinguish individual inputs, um, uh, it's still tricky to see some of those, those labels um, because the text is pretty small. So I'm gonna contain uh, this whole component into, a, into a, just a white container. Um, now, adding a panel like this, you're gonna wanna introduce some, a bit of space uh, just to give some everything room to, more room to breathe. Um, Lack of white space, it's, it's probably one of the biggest mistakes I see developers make when designing for the web. Um, so I wanna share a little bit of a framework I use to help solve this problem. So the common approach to introducing space is to add 
just a a bit at a time, and if it still feels too tight, you continue adding a bit more, right? But the problem with this approach is that you're only adding like the minimum amount of space until the site no longer looks bad. So as you introduce more space, it's going to look better than your cramped starting point, but this may cause you to almost like stop too early um, when trying to find that right amount and sort of, sort of leaving you a bit uncertain. So I find a better approach is to start with way too much white space and then remove it until you're sort of happy with the result. Now, at first, when focused on an individual component, you might think it feels like too much white space, um, but in context of the rest of the UI, it ends up looking like just the right amount. So um, next, let's take a look at these inputs. So first, always remember to use uh, input length as an affordance. You want to create an expectation of how long an entry should be. Um, so uh, in all these cases, you can probably fit the input into a field that's about half the size uh, so of the current width. So in this case, it allows us to comfortably fit all of the fields into one line when on a full desktop view like this. Now, major elements like the container aren't the only thing on the page that needs room to breathe. Uh, this also applies to components like inputs. So I'm going to increase the height of the inputs. Um, I like to be generous with space on inputs, like usually like give them like a total height of like 40 or 48 pixels. That, so that's like the size of the font plus like the padding around it. Um, now at the moment, the inputs have uh, just a simple border around them um, with inner white space. Um, this isn't that distinct when it's like when the input's on a white background. A nice way to add a bit more distinction is to add like a subtle off-white background to the input. I find there's like a fine line of, of just enough to create that distinction, but not too much where it looks disabled. So. Um, and just to give the inputs a little more visual interest and scannability, we're going to add some icons. Now, we're not going to replace the labels with icons because you know, the icons we're using aren't that obvious, and it's generally just bad for accessibility to remove the labels. Uh, but when adding icons to support text, it might make sense to give them the same color as the text. But the problem with this is that icons, they end up looking more emphasized, as you see here. Um, you want a balanced weight and contrast. So, when working with solid icons like this, they tend to look heavy because they cover a lot more of that surface area. And this creates that unbalanced contrast when placed next to text that contains a lot less of that surface area. So a simple way to reduce the contrast is by giving the icons a softer color. So um, this sort of works like a counterbalance, making heavier elements feel lighter, even though the weight hasn't changed at all. Um, now, We've given these inputs a nice treatment. Uh, what about the radio buttons and the checkboxes? Like right now, they're just that boring browser default look. If you're on like Safari, for example, um, so a sure way to make an app look more polished is is to remove any of the browser defaults with something more custom. This is a great opportunity to add some color and take something from feeling boring and feeling more well designed. Um, this goes the same for inputs. You know, you can change that drop down arrow to something that's more consistent with the other icons you're using in the set. So. Um, that's a small change there. Uh, in that change, I also reduced the size of the labels just so they're not taking away from the, the value itself. Um, they're just there to support the, the value. So um, let's also better utilize the horizontal space here um, by moving the search button to the far right so it's aligned with the, with the check boxes on the left. Um, this will overall like reduce the overall vertical space, which is always nice. Um, and this also lines up nicely, um, so it's below like the last input users are likely to interact with, so they aren't jumping from like left to right. Um, let's also increase the height of the button so it's consistent with the inputs. Um, plus, we can add an icon to the just provide a little bit more clarity to. Um, so we'll add a, a search icon to that. Um, let's introduce that yellow now that I found on that dribble shot. Um, now, it's always difficult to achieve high contrast ratios with white text on bright colors like yellow or green. Um, so like, if you want to get like a high contrast ratio with yellow, you end up getting something closer to bronze, and that's not really any good. Uh, so the creative way to work around this is to invert the colors. So instead of using white text on a dark background, you need to use dark text on a white bright background. Uh, now, we already learned in the subtitle that we don't want to use black or white text on a colored background. Uh, so once again, we're going to saturate this with a bit of the background color. So uh, again, if I'm using the like the tailwind colors, I would just take a, a like a darker yellow or orange, right? Um, so we're sort of doing the opposite of what we did with the subtitle uh, because yellow is a brighter color. We need to find a darker color. Um, now, just to better associate the upsell 
check boxes on the, on the far left here. Um, we're going to uh, just contain them uh, in a in a in a gray box here. Just to it's a nice way of like creating a border without actually having a border, so it's a lot cleaner. Um, so now having the the panel in the hero like this, it does a great job of standing out, but it's not very interesting. So uh, an easy way to make this pop out more is give it some depth. Now, there's a few ways of doing that. Um, one way is to overlap elements to create that depth. In this case, instead of containing the card entirely within a hero section, you can offset it. So it sits between the two background sections using negative, a negative margin. So that looks sort of cool, but uh, because the panels shares the same background color as the, the panel below. It's looking a bit funny, so we need to add some distinction. So since we're trying to give it some depth, let's, let's give it a heavy box shadow to convey elevation. So um, that gives us some nice depth, but I want to explain my process for creating shadows a bit more. Um, so the first thing worth noting is that I often use multiple shadows within a design to position elements differently on the, the virtual Z index, right? The larger the shadow you use, the closer it's going to feel to the user. So usually how it goes is I'll have a small shadow for elements that are closer to the background of the page. Um, this is typically for like buttons or inputs. Um, then I'll have one that's a little further off the page, usually for elements like drop down menus or, or small panels. Um, and then sometimes I'll have an additional one for like large panels. Uh, for example, if I'm using, I'll, I'll be using this one on the panel we're currently discussing because I really want it to pop. And then finally, I'll have like a large one for like modals. So I might go between one of the two shadows on the, on the far right there. So here it is again in context. So um, you can see that the middle shadow on the previous page, it's, it's quite heavy in context. Um, but there's a bit more to that than just offsetting a box shadow with a heavy blur. Um, you need to consider that shadows have two parts. So what do I mean by that? Well, when you look at shadows in the real world, they are typically created by more than one light source that gets disrupted by an object. Like one is usually an ambient light, um, and the other is a direct light source. So um, the shadow created by the ambient light is usually like a tighter and darker with like less of a vertical offset and a smaller blur radius. So that's kind of seen below the, the vase there. And the shadow created by the direct light source is is usually a larger and softer with like a like more of a cons like it has more of a vertical offset than with a larger blur radius. So I like to consider that when I when I make these shadows on the web. Um, so so furthermore, as an object gets further, it slowly covers the direct light source. So consider that by introducing a negative spread value. So. Um, if you're going to use this two shadow technique on your own projects, make sure you make the direct light shadow more subtle for shadows that represent a higher elevation. So, um, and this just gives you a little bit more creative control when then working with a single shadow. Okay, back to the design. Now, now that we've offset the background below, um, it, it gave it an, and we gave it a nice shadow. We're going to do one more thing, and that is to use color to convey depth. So, in general, with screen design. Um, Lighter objects feel closer to us than darker objects. So to make something feel more raised off the background, we can make it a subtle off-white, um, just to create that additional contrast. Um, so yeah, that helps it pop out a lot more. There's three little techniques there. Um, so now that we've made the background off-white, it sort of pushed the table back. Um, so further emphasizing my point about color and depth. So we're going to contain that in a panel too. Uh, now, we don't want this to have the same amount of depth as the search panel. Um, we want this to stand back a bit further. So um, just going back to the shadows we have, uh, we're going to use the second shadow shown here just to bring it back a little bit. Uh, now, styling tables, it can be tricky. It's often a lot of data to present in a condensed space. Um, so there are a few tricks that we'll go through here. Uh, the first thing is, is we're going to use alignment. Um, so for most content, it makes sense to left align the content. Um, but for content like dollar values, it's sometimes and sometimes dates, it's always nice to right align them. Um, just so the decimal places are in columns, it makes it much easier to compare the numbers of magnitudes, right? Now, here's a cool little CSS trick, since you know, this is CSS day. <laughs> Another cool thing you can do is apply tabular numbers. So this can be achieved by uh, setting the font feature settings to tnum, as seen here. And it basically makes the text value act like a monospace font without actually using a monospace font. Um, 
Uh, now, the borders on this table, they're looking a bit busy. Um, so whenever possible, use fewer borders. Borders uh, can make a design look pretty cluttered. So um, a nice way to do that with, with table design is use uh, zebra striping, of course. OK, let's also look at the headings on here. Um, there's sort of this preconceived notion that headings need to be big and bold to stand out against the rest of the um, page text. But in many cases, headings like this, they're more or less acting like labels. That They are there to support the content. Uh, they shouldn't be stealing the attention away. So that means that like headings like this should be a bit more subtle. So I find a great treatment for headings like this is that small, bold, uppercase text with the softer color. Like, you know, the small, softer treatment helps them stand back against that table content, but that bolder uppercase treatment helps them maintain that heading status. So I like to use that quite a bit. Um, so let's look in cleaner, but let's try a few more ideas here. Uh, think outside the database. Um, now, if columns don't need to be sortable, um, try consolidating secondary information, just for like a bit of a cleaner look. It opens things up a little bit. Uh, consider de-emphasizing that with like, like smaller and lighter text, so to highlight that, like that primary information. And if the data calls for it, try enhancing it using images. Um, and also, these book now buttons on the, on the right, there, it, it's looking pretty heavy on the right because they're dark and in a single column. So it really draws you away from the other important elements on it. So we want to give them more of a secondary treatment. So you know, a popular approach to this is styling buttons by simply outlining them. Um, you know, this does give them that secondary appearance, but uh, I find a great alternative to this is to give the buttons a um, soft, solid background based on the text color. Um, so this just isn't quite as heavy. It's a lot cleaner. Let's also make this text link the same color as our the top, like the text link up on the top right. We'll make it the same color as our brand color used everywhere else. Um, so um, there, and just to give it more of a link style, you know, we often use like an underline to style it as links, but um, I find like something to give it a little bit more style to use like a generic icon, like a like a chevron to the right of it, it makes it look more clickable. Um, okay, so I think that's in a pretty good spot now. Um, let's review these vacation package deals at the bottom. Um, so there, I'm using cards to display them. Uh, often working with images like this, you may run into the issue of having different aspect ratios. Um, this can really throw off the layout if you're using multiple images. It might be work on, like if you're doing like a Pinterest layout, you know, you can do something like that. But um, when it's displayed side by side here, it can really throw things off. So instead of just using the image um, at the current aspect ratio, um, we're going to center the image inside a fixed container and then cropping out anything that doesn't fit. Um, you know, we all know the beauty of this is you don't have to edit the image in a tool before bringing it into the web. You can just uh, make the image your background image and then setting the CSS background size property to cover. Um, this cleans up the entire layout. Um, now, we don't necessarily need these buttons at the bottom here, those, those primary buttons. Um, like sites like Airbnb and YouTube, they're both great examples of how card-based layouts can get away without including buttons, and they still manage to look clickable. Uh, now, the details of these cards, it's looking pretty busy, so let's see what we can do to clean it up a bit. Um, the first thing I want to address is the labels on like the price and the website. Uh, in many cases, you don't need a label at all. Um, so for example, like $12.95 is a price, because <laughs> it has a dollar value, and uh, vacationspots.com is a website, because it has the .com. So you don't need a label to identify that. Um, now, when you're able to present data without labels, you get much more creative control, and you can really emphasize important information. So in this case, the price is probably way more important to the user than the website it's getting the deal from. Um, let's also reduce the noise created with these borders by, by just using that same technique I showed you earlier, by using that subtle off-white background to distinguish the sections. Um, and again, try to get creative with the data hierarchy by using a combination of uh, font size, uh, weight, color, and again, using that uppercase treatment, it's, it's always a bit uh, cleaner. Uh, furthermore, we can also use color to enrich some of the data to make it a little bit easier to interpret. So for the example, we have these offerings. So on the first card there, it has like only five left, right? So um, we can put this into like a pill and then, like using these colored badges, uh, just to take them in at a quick glance. Uh, much like our button at the top, we're going to give these badges. Um, sorry, I have another one on the on the right here, that green one. 
we're to give them that soft background color with, uh, with dark text just to make them a bit more subtle and more accessible because like if you put like white text on red, sometimes it's, it's tricky to work. It's tricky to get like those high contrast ratios. So I always find it better to like make the background a bit lighter and using a darker text color. Um, let's also look at this newsletter section. We're getting close to the bottom here. Um, so right now it's just sitting directly on the background. Um, there's nothing distinguishing it. So it's not very compelling. Um, so one way to add excitement to the background is just simply by changing the color. Um, this is just a great way to uh, distinguish, um, like add distinction between like entire page sections like this. Uh, this actually is a great technique to use on like marketing pages. You know, you go to like marketing websites and it splits up the like the hero to the different feature sections. Um, so I see that use, being used quite a bit. Um, so here I applied the, our brand blue to the footer, or uh, to the 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 newsletter section, and then to the footer I use like a darker treatment. Um, you can even go as far as like adding a background pattern. So um, as mentioned earlier, I, I made this site a while ago called Hero Patterns. Um, it's basically a collection of SVG background patterns. It's great for backgrounds on like marketing pages or sections like we're, the one we're working with. Um, that, that topography one's pretty popular. I haven't updated this in a long time. I think there's about 100 patterns on there now. Um, maybe I'll update it again soon. <laughs> Um, ne uh, next, let's make a few changes so these elements are consistent with the changes we've talked about already. So I'm not going to go through them all again, but uh, basically, I made the newsletter description text. I made it that same. I gave it that same color treatment as the subtitle at the top. I also reintroduced that yellow button as it has that great contrast on the blue backgrounds, and and then finally, I increased the the size of the inputs to be the same as everywhere else. Uh, now this section, it's, it's a little heavy. It's taken up a lot more vertical space than it needs to. So if you're working on a design like this, it, it that takes up a lot of vertical space. Um, you can, you know, better utilize your horizontal space by, uh, by trying to like splitting it up into columns. Um, sort of, it works great, especially in a case like this, where you have like a, that solid background, that solid color background, and it still manages to associate the elements quite nicely. Um, so yeah. Um, Let's move on to the footer now. Um, now I love big footers like this. It sort of acts like a, a catch-all if you have like a lot of nav items, but you need to include. But they're not important enough to occupy like that real estate at the top in the top nav. But with that, it's still nice to have some structure when you have a large sitemap like this. So to handle this, um, I like adding like those subtle labels to each section um, using that small bold like like uppercase treatment for headings. Uh, so I've used that quite a bit already. Um, and finally, the last thing that stands out is the legal jargon and social media links at the bottom there. Right now, they're just sort of floating there. Um, now, I know I, men I mentioned, like, I keep preaching not to like, use fewer borders, but, um, you know, we, I talked about this earlier at the, uh, on the top bar, how using borders, it sort of helps associate elements a bit better. Um, so, yeah, that... Pretty much wraps everything up. I have a few more finishing touches, though, um, just to bring this to the next level. Um, first thing is grays don't have to be gray. Um, pure grays can make a UI look pretty dull and unnatural. Uh, so what I like to do is saturate the grays with a bit of blue um, or brown for like a cooler or warmer look. Uh, so the thinking here is that you're sort of adjusting the overall temperature of the site. Um, this is similar to what you, we experience in the real world by like a combination of things, right? Like, so maybe you have like a light source, like if you're using a warm light or like a white light, um, you may even get this effect by like reflective services. So it just makes everything feel more natural when you saturate the grays a bit. So if you want to make your design feel more cool, saturate your grays with a bit of blue. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it on this projector, but the bottom one is a bit more has a bit of a cooler look. So I just adjusted the saturation and, and hue a little bit. And if you want to make them a bit warmer, try saturating them with a bit of yellow or brown. Um, I mostly saturate my grays with a bit of blue because I'm working, like especially in this case, I'm working with uh, my like my primary color is blue. Um, I might use warmer colors if I'm working with like warmer colors like red or sometimes purple. Um, sometimes it could work with blue. Um, like I know Basecamp, they consciously uh, made their site, their site's like their primary color is blue, but they they use kind of like some warmer colors for their background. So, you know, experiment and play with both. Now when doing this, if, if you're working with like HSL, uh, which I recommend, don't forget to increase the saturation 
um, for the lighter and darker shades to maintain a consistent temperature. So if you don't, those shades will look a bit washed out com um, compared to the grays that are closer to 50% lightness. And how much you want to saturate your grays is completely up to you. So um, add just a little if you want to you know, tip, tip the temperature slightly or uh, crank it up if you want to increase it to lean strongly in one direction or the other. Um, and just because it's hard to see on that, on that chart, um, here's what it looks like um, when they're side by side. So uh, this is what it looks like when it's like not quite as saturated. There is a bit more saturated. You can kind of see the change there. Um, there they are, if it's hard to tell, there they are stacked. So you can mostly see it on, on, the, lighter, on the lighter grays there. So they're a bit more saturated at the bottom. Okay, um, so, you know, I, I usually go for the more saturated look, so here's the difference that makes. So it just kind of livens things up a little bit. But finally, I just want to share a few insights on choosing fonts. Um, this is one of the biggest mistakes I see developers make, um, and it does have one of the highest impacts. So um, at the moment, this design is just using the system default stack, um, so in this case, San Francisco, because I use a Mac. Um, this is a great font. But um, like I actually quite like San Francisco. Like I especially like using the system font stack on like in an app experience. And then um, if I'm working on like a marketing page, then I might use like a custom font. Um, but I think it's worth exploring a few different options. Uh, you know, because this is a design talk. I think it's worth talking about fonts. Uh, so I thought I'd share how I discover new fonts. So um, there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, Fonts are pretty much everywhere. You can simply just search for popular fonts on Google Fonts or, or like Typekit or Adobe Fonts, which is which it is now. Um, they're all great services, but it's not very fun. I want to get into a little bit more detail. Um, I find it much. I get much more interesting results by digging a bit further. So this involves like a combination of getting inspiration from existing sites. Um, sort of the same way I find color combinations. I'll, I'll find a site I like and then. Uh, look at the browser dev tools and see what fonts are being used. Sometimes I go right to the Font Foundry website. So these are the companies that design the fonts, and I see what fonts are, they have available. Um, I like going to Heffler fonts a lot. Um, Commercial Type is one of my favorites, and uh, the Klim Type Foundry, just to name a few. Um, but I want to share how I use a combination of these methods to choosing fonts, and how I landed with the font that I'm going to be using for this design. Uh, so just like choosing color, I go to all the same spots uh, for inspiration. So uh, I'll go to Landbook or I'll go to Site Inspire and see what fonts are being used there. Um, in this particular case, one time I was like casually browsing the web looking for inspiration. I found myself looking at the official Bootstrap themes, just kind of looking, see what they had there. I came across this one that had uh, it was quite nice, and I was curious about the font being used. So from naturally, I opened the Dev Tools to see what font was being used. But I didn't want to stop there. I wanted to learn more about this font. Uh, so I Googled it, and uh, just to learn more information about it. And from there, I learned it was designed by a foundry called Henkin Design, where they, they've designed a, a ton of custom high-quality fonts. So I picked up the bundle they had for sale. And then from that bundle, I noticed a font called, I found this font called Butter Exchange that I thought would be perfect for this project. So um, let's take a look at that change. So here is with San Francisco, and here is with Butter Exchange. And, you know, it's not a crazy change, but it's, it's something a little more unique. And, you know, I've been doing a combination of these methods for finding fonts for a long time, and I've built up a decent collection so, um, that I've been going back to regularly. So um, it's just a great approach to finding new fonts. So that pretty much wraps everything up. Um, but let's just compare this to what we started with. So here's our starting point. And here's where we landed. So yeah, it just, I think it just goes to show that you know, it can be overwhelming to go from like your starting point to the end point. Uh, but really, it's just a bunch of small little changes. And uh, at, by the end, you'll end up with a, a more polished looking website. So um, I'm going to plug my book right now. Um, if you enjoyed the talk and found it useful, I really recently launched this book with my friend Adam Lavin. Uh, it's called Refactoring UI. Um, so it's loaded with a ton of practical tips like the ones I've uh, shared today. Um, and it's 40% off right now. <laughs> um, I'm also quite active on Twitter, so you can find me at Stu Shoger, um, where I share a ton of tips, um, like the ones I shared today. So thank you. Thank you yeah.
Bare feet, very nice. Always. <laughs> Always. Everyone who's walked me uh, previous talks knows that that's how I do. Yeah. Um, first off, I love those sort of breakdowns, that sort of comprehensive thing. It's always a beautiful thing to see. Thank yeah. Uh, so we got a few interesting questions here. Yes. First off, you mentioned uh, a little bit of uh, color accessibility, but a lot of your changes seem to be like on a wildcatting in a bit. How much do you pay attention to color contrast, like in terms of WCAG accessibility? Or yeah, I yeah. follow that quite closely. Like I have this like menu bar tool called Contrast. Mm -hmm. It was by Matt Smith and Sam Sauce, their names are. Uh, I think I'm saying their name right, his name right. Um, and I always kind of check that uh, to make sure it's accessible. You're probably not like seeing the same thing that I'm seeing on like my Retina Display Monitor that's to true. this projector. That's yeah. safe, but um, I'm always quite active on that. So I'm, yeah, I'm, and hell, that's why WK accessibility exists because these are still readable on this sort of screen, yeah. even with the very depressed color depth. Yeah, yeah. So I'm always using that, and the the, the contrast app I use is just a just I. I think it's just contrastapp.com, and it's just a little menu bar tool, and I can just sample the colors and, and, and reference them there. Very cool. Uh, so an interesting question here. So you did a lot of color theming. This was uh, largely a blue like underlying theme for yes. a lot of this. Um, but some things come with their own color scheme kind of naturally. Warnings and alerts and whatnot, often green, yellow, or red or something. Yes. What do you do if the site's branding guidelines are already in those colors and then they want to do yeah, something like alerts? Yeah, that's tricky. Like if the site's red, but then you have like a red alert. Yeah. I still stick with like red alerts. Um, I, 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 I've, I've been asked this a lot. I, I, I don't know how to answer that question, but I <laughs> usually just work with like... Like red is high severity. I think many people know that. Um, and uh, like usually, if like the primary color is red, I like like most sites are like white and like grays, right? From mm -hmm. like white for backgrounds and gray for text, and then you use like the like the primary color for like actions. And mm -hmm. so I might tone down that. Just use hints of the red. And then uh, that helps, like, if you're using it for, like, alerts and stuff, you can, you can emphasize that a bit more, right? Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, so I noticed that your placeholders uh, for your input fields seem to be styled the same as the value while you're typing. What's your opinion on styling around placeholders for inputs? Uh, sorry. So you're, the, when you're typing in the field, you have the placeholder. They look the same, like color, contrast, whatnot. Oh yeah, input. I actually like for my example, I had them like, just like pre-filled as if that was those weren't like the placeholder. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I should have maybe mentioned that. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I'd make it a bit lighter, like just enough where it's like accessible, and then make the 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 value that you're typing in like your normal text color, like a dark, your darkest gray. Okay. Uh. Final question before we head off to lunch. Um, how important do you think it is for designers to stay up with CSS progress in terms of new things available or not versus just like learning some basics and then continuing to focus mostly on design sensibilities? What do you think the good balance is? Um, I think it's important to understand like what, 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 you're cap what, like what CSS is capable of. Um, I think that helped me early in my career is um, learning a little bit of code. It helped differentiate me from like other designers and I was able to, it's more like making it easier to communicate with developers. So like speaking their language a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but if you work closely with developers, like, you know, you can, you can like count on them to like kind of teach you that stuff, but just, uh, but I think it's important to like learn the basics, right? Like how it actually works, but yeah. All right, well, thank you yeah. very much, Steve. Yeah, thank you.